Hello, everybody. Welcome. While you're all connecting to audio, and we're just going to let folks come in and get settled. And we were just talking about how we might invite you to introduce yourselves um, in the chat. And uh, we agreed we wanted to know where is home for you. So you can answer that however you like um, in as much or as little detail as you want. Um, but uh, we invite you to share in the chat. Um, where's home? I have three places that feel like home to me. From Auckland, welcome. Okay, and then I think um. We definitely have a critical mass of people here. So as folks are introducing themselves, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started and welcome us. My name is Amy Starczewski. I direct the Oral History Master of Arts program. Um, and this event is part of our semester long series on experiments in oral history methodology. Um, and I think because people come to these series from so many different places, both geographically and professionally, it's important to explain what we're sort of considering as the the norm when we're talking about experiments. Um, so, you know, I think many people are aware that oral history as a research tool, especially and especially in academic contexts, has often been at times synonymous with a certain kind of long form, sit down, biographical, life history interview that's audio recorded and transcribed and put into an archive to be a primary source. Um, and I think over the past couple of years in particular, indigenous and other critical oral historians, people like Nebia Mahuika, Dan Kerr, um, have really challenged this conflation of oral history with a particular narrow kind of methodology and also have made visible the, the really active processes of both exclusion and appropriation that through which these professional oral history practices have been formed. So they didn't happen by accident. People intentionally decided that this kind of encircled thing was gonna be the thing that would count as an academic kind of oral history. So as a program, um, we acknowledge both the Lenape people who stewarded the land on which we are right now, um, who were violently dispossessed from this place and who continue to, to be here, to resist here and elsewhere, um, and to take care of this land. But we also acknowledge the roots of our field in these colonial epistemologies that, that actively delegitimized indigenous oral history practices. And so um, one of our goals as a program is to, to move beyond that narrow version of oral history and that's why I curated this series this semester um, <clears throat> to open up just more, more ways of experimenting with what oral history looks like. Um, and so I'm really, really excited to welcome Christina Douglas to the series this evening. Um, I saw her speak um, last May, I guess, right towards the end of the semester and was so excited to learn about what she's doing and, and immediately thought it would be um, really valuable to bring her into conversation with the folks in OMA. Um, she's an archeologist who investigates how people, land and seascapes co-evolve. Um, and we've talked a lot in this program about what it would mean to do oral histories of land, to do oral histories of animals. Um, so I'm really glad to, to see that sort of broad focus of evolution. Uh, she's an associate professor of climate at Columbia and also a Smithsonian Institution Research Associate. Her work is grounded in collaborations with local indigenous and descendant communities as equal partners in the co-production of science and the recording, preservation, and dissemination of that knowledge. Um, so we we often we don't often think of our oral history work as production of scientific knowledge. And so I'm really interested, especially to be in conversation with you tonight, Christina, about what that science framing does for the, the moves we have to make to change what counts as expertise. Um, with, her collabor with her collaborators, she aims to contribute long-term perspectives on human environment interactions to public debates, planning and policymaking on the issues of climate change, conservation and sustainability since 2011. 
She's directed the Morombe Archaeological Project in Southwest Madagascar. She's also a mother, singer, dancer, caporista, scuba diver, and avid gardener, all of which intersect in essential ways with her work as an archaeologist and climate scientist. And when I saw this bio, it kind of made me want to rewrite mine to include a little bit more of who I am as a person. So thank you for sharing that, that broader sense of yourself with us. Uh, so for folks who are just coming in, um, the prompt is to introduce yourself in the chat uh, by saying a little bit about where is home for you. Um, and with that, as those continue to flow in, I'm going to invite you to welcome Christina and hand it over to her. Thank you for coming, Christina. Thank you so much, Amy. It's wonderful to be here. I love this space that you've created and love that I can be in conversation with you all. As an archaeologist, I think oral history has become so fundamental to the work that we're doing in archaeology. And I was just last week at a celebration symposium for my doctoral advisor, Rod McIntosh, who's also an archaeologist and spent most of his career working in West Africa. And I mentioned in my talk that what I'm going to share with you today in part was inspired by something I read in a book he co-edited called The Way the Wind Blows. And I think this volume came out in maybe 2000. And he highlighted the importance of understanding social memory as archeologists interested in landscape and landscape change. And at the time, I think he was really ahead of the archeological community in thinking about how oral history could play a role in particularly in that case, understanding human adaptation to climate in the past. And while I think the field of archaeology has come a long way in terms of understanding that importance, there's so much more integration and conversation that can happen and should happen between archaeology and oral history. And then the second thing I want to share before I launch is that I was recently at an amazing meeting in Alaska convened by the National Academies of Sciences to work through the best practices and principles of knowledge co-production in terms of environmental questions. And Amy, in her introduction, just posed this question about what role oral history might be able to play in terms of interacting with the production of scientific knowledge around environment and climate in my case. And I just wanna drop as a tidbit to think about. I'm not going to discuss it too much now, but let's return to it at the end. Something that one of the elders at that meeting said about different knowledge coming together. You know, the idea behind co-production is something that we we may all have some different ideas about, but what what does it mean to bring together different stakeholders, different communities, different knowledges and produce something from those knowledges? And Wilson Justin uh, an Inupiaq elder said, I think incredibly profoundly, parallel lines never meet, but given the right conditions and circumstances and the, the respect that is needed, they can stop, we can stop along those parallel tracks and we can engage with one another. So I'm going to leave you with that as we launch into Southwest Madagascar and thinking about the land that our ancestors have stewarded and how it sustains us. Now, let me see. I just said that I could figure out how to make this screen share work and now I can't find it again. Oh, here we go. Give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen. Okay. So this is a view of Southwest Madagascar, the Micaea territories of the Southwest. If you look in the distance, you'll see the coast about 20 to 25 kilometers from where we are here in the Namunti Basin. This is one of the core regions that we're doing this research in, where we're combining archaeology, oral history, um, paleoecology, and paleoclimate work to understand how landscapes and seascapes that we see today have co-evolved over time. And what I want you to take from this is just that as an archaeologist, I am thinking about the evolution of landscapes including many different processes and many different inputs. So I'm thinking about landscape evolution from a physical sciences perspective in terms of how the geology, the hydrology, all of those kind of physical dimensions of the landscape evolve. 
but I'm also thinking about it from this sort of evolutionary perspective and thinking about, um, you know, natural selection, niche construction, which is something that I'm going to talk about here. But I'm also thinking about it from a cultural perspective and trying to understand what role culture, social memory, identity play in terms of shaping these landscapes. And of course, not forgetting historical events and how those intersect with these sort of evolutionary dynamics. And as a sort of historical ecologist, I see land and seascapes as accumulation of all of these processes and that really to understand the, the land and the seas around us, we can't separate any of these out. We, we have to be able to develop approaches that allow us to integrate all of these. And so I'm going to share a Vezu proverb with you. You can keep your sound off or you can unmute, but I, I'd like to invite you to repeat it after me. Zetane mahavelu ka taninjaza. Go ahead, Amy. I see you unmuted. <laughs> Zetane mahavelu ka tenendraja. That's perfect. And of course, you all maybe don't all know this, but Amy already speaks Malagasy. So if it sounded perfect, it's because she already speaks Malagasy. It was that was amazing. But that proverb, I think, really underpins the the approach that I bring to environmental archaeology, which is to understand the intergenerational contributions to that landscape evolution. Um, and so the literal translation is the title of this talk, the land that sustains us is the land of the ancestors. And when we think about oral history in our team as archaeologists, we are thinking about the input, the transmission of ecological, cultural, and all kinds of legacies that are, are coming from one generation to the next um, into the present, and really thinking with gratitude about what um, the ancestors have given us. Okay. So I always start by introducing our team. Uh, and I will say that I'm going to spend time introducing the Madagascar based side of the team. This team is also anchored here at Columbia by the OBT lab, which stands for Ulube Taluha. Ulube Taluha means the elders of the past. So our lab at Columbia, again, pays tribute to ancestors. And here in Madagascar, the team is known as the Murumbe Archaeological Project. Murumbe is the district that we're working in. And our team is made up of members of local communities, primarily within what's called the Velundriac Marine Protected Area, which is part of the political unit, um, Commune de Befandefa. And this is a, a sort of a unit made up of about 35 different communities. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the cultural diversity within those communities in a moment. People on the team represent different ages, backgrounds in terms of um, formal education um, and literacy. And we take the um, stance that everybody on our team needs to have an opportunity to learn every skill, every methodology, every technique that we use on the project. This doesn't mean that everybody has to like, um, let's say, ceramic analysis or GIS. But the idea is that as a team, we're engaging in full knowledge exchange. Everybody who has something to teach teaches it to the whole team. And uh, that allows us to come to the table in terms of developing research questions, approaches, and interpreting our results and our data as equals in terms of the, the sharing of knowledge. So that's our, our philosophy. We also feel very strongly about being contributors to the Velendriac and Bifandefa communities. And so in the bottom right, you see George Manahira, known as Beek, who's my co-director um, on the Madagascar side, and he's leading a um, sort of COVID sanitation effort. We fundraised during the pandemic to bring PPE and other supplies, excuse me, <laughs> to Southwest Madagascar um, as our contribution to the community. And currently, as part of both a research project and a development project, we are building a series of toilet facilities in the community. Um, and I say research project because we developed a, uh, a kind of toolkit 
um, for co-designing with between community members, uh, researchers, and other stakeholders, co-designing development projects. And that's a paper that came out that was led by um, Danny Bufa and Kate Thompson in the OBT lab just last year. And our first project um, that has come out of that paper is to work on the um, these facilities in the community. So quick presentation on the team. Here's a view of Andavadok, which is our home base in Southwest Madagascar. It's a community uh, now of about 3000 people. Uh, it's growing rapidly because of the huge amount of interest and investment in extracting marine resources from this part of Madagascar. So there are a number of larger corporations and companies that have an interest um, in this community, which means, you know, investment in building a road, investment in creating uh, different kinds of storage facilities for marine products. And as a result, the community is growing pretty quickly. I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what this landscape looks like. Southwest Madagascar is home to some of the greatest levels of biodiversity and endemicity on Madagascar, which is saying a lot because as you may know, Madagascar already is known worldwide as an island with high biodiversity and high levels of endemicity, meaning that so many of the plants and animals that are found on Madagascar are found nowhere else in the world. Um, and so the Southwest stands out even um, within Madagascar as having high levels of endemicity. Here you're seeing a view of the Lambuada Peninsula which is just about six kilometers south of the village of Antavadok that I just showed you. And you can see a combination of different marine habitats here, mangrove stands, um, sort of shallow fringing reef, um, sandbar, et cetera. And then some of the um, short, dry, spiny vegetation that's so characteristic of Southwest Madagascar. We've been doing archaeological survey, if you look at this map, um, going as far north as the map shows um, and as far south as the map shows over the last 12 years. And we've documented hundreds of archaeological surface scatters and have excavated dozens of archaeological sites in that time. So here's that view without the map, a little bit more um, uh, space. <clears throat> Here you're seeing a temporary encampment on an offshore island. The communities that live in Southwest Madagascar practice a mixed economy, uh, but some communities are more focused on coastal fishing uh, as Vezu communities are, and Vezu communities are semi-nomadic. So they spend part of the year migrating in pursuit of certain high value species, including now things that are desired on the international seafood market, um, like sea cucumber, shark, etc. Um, but here's a temporary Vezu village. <laughs> Excuse me, these are really common on offshore islands as, as Vezu uh, pursue different taxa. Here's a view of the dry deciduous forest. It's sometimes called the spiny forest because literally everything has a thorn on it. I always get made fun of. I'm just going to go back here and say, just to defend myself, I always get made fun of by other archaeologists when, when they see these pictures and they say, oh, it's very clear why you chose to work in this part of the world because it's just, you know, gorgeous. But, you know, when we spend time surveying, I just want to point out that sur doing archaeological survey, and actually you can see our survey team right here in the dry deciduous forest is really tough. And what you can't quite make out here is that the sand is also really deep. So I'm just, you know, I'm just saying um, it's not all, you know, shiny coral seas. This is um, a view from nearby where that previous photo was taken. And what you're seeing here is a perennial stream channel called a Saha. And during the rainy season, um, this, this fills a little bit more. And you see that communities in this region then cultivate the stream beds and the, the channels. Um, again, part of this mixed economy. So communities here in the interior would be practicing a mix of this sort of stream bed um, cultivation, some cattle herding, and some foraging in the dry forest. Again, I'm just showing you some images so you have a sense of what this landscape looks like. Here's a view of a Mikea village surrounded by these amazing octopus trees of the Didieracea family. A uh, fun fact that the octopus trees are really useful for finding your way through the dry forest because they always lean in the direction of the south wind. 
um, because they're trying to absorb moisture from that wind. This is an incredibly dry region. And not only is it dry, but the, um, the rainfall um, comes in very at very unpredictable times. So um, it's, it's pr a pretty challenging environment to, um, to sustain a livelihood in. And um, communities as a result <clears throat> have developed this sort of flexibility in uh, livelihood strategies that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. This region is also really well known for the baobab trees that dot the landscape. Uh, Madagascar is home to, I believe, seven endemic baobab species out of the nine baobab species that exist worldwide. So a high level of uh, diversity of that one family um, on Madagascar. And as archaeologists, we pay close attention to baobabs because they are one of these species that have a very close relationship with human communities. They tend to appear around archaeological sites. And uh, so there's an interesting relationship there in terms of stewardship of those species and sort of interspecies interactions between people and baobabs. Here's a, a Micaiah man who is showing us some of the harvest from the dry forest. He's showing us some uh, tenrec, which are again, a, another um, endemic family to Madagascar. They're sort of hedgehog-like hedgehog uh, critters that um, uh, many people harvest in the dry forest. Ramuzeti Kelly is one of the historians we interviewed as part of this project. And here she is showing us cultivation in that Saha stream bed channel of manioc. And then we have a, a young man here who's showing us how he um, harvests the prickly pear cactus pads and then prepares them as fodder for his cattle. And he would be considered a member of the Masikuru uh, community. And Masikuru, although all of these communities practice a mixed economy, are more focused on cattle herding of the um, uh, kind of uh, iconic Malagasy Zebu cattle. And here's a herd crossing the Manumbu River. Okay. I spend most of my time on the coast working with Vezu fishing communities. And I just want to point you in the direction of some amazing photography by my colleague Garth Cripps, who's a part of this project and is an ongoing collaborator. Um, if you're interested in seeing more images from Southwest Madagascar, particularly of the coast, I encourage you to Google Garth Cripps and um, take a look at his website, which is really amazing. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So archaeology and human environment dynamics. Um, as an archaeologist, you know, I started working in this region doing some of the classic archaeology things where you survey the landscape, you look for remains of ancient communities on the surface, and then you develop a plan for how you're going to investigate subsurface levels to see how um, people lived in the past and how they interacted with their environment in the past. A lot of the material that we worked with were things like animal bones, um, because we were excavating middens where people were discarding refuse from the kinds of animals and plants that they were consuming. And when I first came to work in the Southwest, I was particularly interested in understanding the extinction of megafauna on Madagascar. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. The megafauna on Madagascar is a whole other subject for a whole other talk. Um, but suffice it to say that a number of species weighing over uh, 40 kilos is what qualifies as, a, as megafauna for Madagascar, went extinct sometime in the last thousand years. And there's a huge debate about why they went extinct, whether people were involved in that extinction process. And that's what first brought me to the Southwest because I was interested in uh, disentangling that question. And there were a lot of um, sites with megafauna remains in the Southwest. Uh, but my research became much more focused on understanding daily life and the, the practices of um, harvesting resources from, from the surrounding area, including on the coast, um, marine species in particular. And one of the things that we had to do early on that um, began, I think, to open the door in terms of our thinking on the team about oral history and recording traditional knowledge 
was building a comparative collection of marine fauna skeletons. As an archaeologist, if you're looking here at the bottom left-hand side of the screen where my cursor is, you're looking at a bunch of really fragmented animal bones. This is typical in Southwest Madagascar. We, we rarely get nice levels of preservation of, of faunal material and, and of other materials. So we really rely heavily on being able to look at comparative samples to help us identify what species a particular bone may have come from. Because if we can't identify that, then it's really hard um, to infer and understand how people were making decisions about what resources to harvest, how they were managing resources in the land around them. So we built this comparative collection through a really close collaboration with Vezu Fishers. And as we were building the collection, we sort of co-developed this approach to building comparative collections, integrating local, local knowledge as well as more um, traditionally Western scientific knowledge. <clears throat> so for example, as we were building this collection, we recorded information about um, Vezu's understanding of the ecology of these species, Vezu's understanding of and observations of um, the abundance of these species, um, all kinds of information that is typically not available in the comparative collections you might find at big museums like the Smithsonian's uh, Natural History Museum. So this was one of our first efforts to join together traditional, including intergenerational knowledge and the kind of archeological um, information and techniques that are, are more typical of archeology. span And it opened the door for us to be able to um, not only enrich the archeological results, which you, you kind of see here where we're looking at different sites and understanding that actually people in this region were making really unique choices about what types of resources to harvest. In other words, um, different communities, even communities in close proximity to one another, were not harvesting indiscriminately. Um, they were really making particular choices about what species they wanted to rely on at different and the changes through time. But it allowed us to get more involved in thinking about oral history. And um, I, I just want to start by sharing kind of the oral history as I understood it when I started working in this region, which is that sometime in the last 400 years, clans that were loyal to the Andre Vula and Marusengana kings, um, again, around 400, this began around 400 years ago, migrated into the Southwest. And as these different um, kings, you know, began to sort of compete with one another over tribute and over territory, the communities that had migrated with them found themselves in increasingly insecure conditions where they were subject to raids um, and other forms of, of violence and political insecurity. And the historians uh, share that at that time, the communities that, that were feeling the most pressure decided to flee but in different ways. So some fled to offshore islands and became known as and self-identify as the Vezu fishers that we have today on the coast. And the, the term Vezu literally means to paddle. It's the imperative form of the verb uh, to paddle. It's like, get out of there. Some communities went and retreated deeper into the dry deciduous forest and became known as the Mekea today. And then others remained more or less loyal to the kings and retained this priority of uh, herding cattle and maintaining a pastoral way of life. But what we know from all the, the oral histories that have been recorded in the Southwest is that these groups that now are thought of as being sort of separate in terms of their identities as Vezu, Mike, or Masikuru actually all share common clan lineages and affiliations and that the the relationship between these different groups is much closer than it might appear if you were just looking at them from this sort of livelihood-based um, uh, identity definition as Vezu, Mike, or Masikuru. So we decided beginning in 2017 to be much more systematic in terms of, of oral history documentation in this area, whereas prior to that, we had sort of um, 
taking the approach that I think a lot of archaeologists take, which is where you already have an idea of what you want to study, where you want to excavate, where you want to survey. And when you introduce yourself in a community, you might sit down with an elder in that community and informally have a conversation about the particular sites you already have your, your eyes on. In 2017, we decided to conduct a wider survey. Excuse me. And you see here um, two of the different survey teams on the left, one at the top left, uh, led by Professor Chesneta from the University of Tuliar and Bram Tucker, who's a professor at the University of Georgia. And they were interviewing um, elders in the Micaiah region, so a little bit further inland from the coast. And in the bottom left, you see member of the um, Murumbay Archaeological Project team, uh, Monsieur Roger Samba, who's also the former president of the Velendrick Fishers Association, interviewing an elder um, on the coast. And so we, in all, in this project, interviewed over 120 elders across these different communities and recorded um, well over 100 hours worth of audio and have been since then um, uh, transcribing and um, sort of analyzing this archive for to answer different questions and i'm going to i'm going to share a little bit of some some of the questions we've been um, thinking about in this project and i'm going to weave in some of the experimental approaches that we've been taking that i've shared previously with amy okay so here again are this is Ramuzeti Be, who is the, it's ironic because her sister who was cultivating manioc in the photo I showed earlier is known as Ramuzeti Kelly, but she's substantial, and Kelly in Malagasy means small. Um, and this is her sister Ramuzeti Be, which means big, but Ramuzeti Be is ver a very tiny petite person. And her sister uh, Ramuzeti Kelly is much bigger than she is. Anyway, it's just, uh, it's very cute. Uh, so here's the first ex sort of experimental thing that we've done that I want to share with you all. And I, I just want you to be thinking about this and to feel free to interject with questions or, or comments as we go along here. <laughs> but here, one of the historians, Remisi, who's a Micaiah, uh, Micaiah historian in the Namunti Basin here, agreed to put on the live feed goggles from our drone. So we were doing drone survey to kind of map and document the landscape, the wider landscape. And we had these VR goggles that allow you to see what the drone sees in real time. And it's kind of a an out-of-body experience because you can actually see yourself looking at something totally different, but you can see yourself as the drone sees you. And um, a couple of historians were willing to do this, but Remisi was the only one, I think, who um, relaxed into the experience and, and was able to then share. Um, everybody shared, but, but some of the things that he shared were really triggered, I think, by, or new memories were sort of triggered by this experience of seeing the landscape from a totally different perspective. So what we decided to try was to have Remisi share memories of particular sites from three different perspectives. One being this aerial perspective, wearing the live feed goggles. Another being at the surface level as we're walking around the site together. So a team of archaeologists you know, walking with him, taking notes as he's pointing out features of different sites, the location of, let's say, um, uh, uh, you know, the um, uh, an elder's house that he remembers on site or he remembers the Hazumanga um, post, which is sort of a, a sacred uh, feature of communities where a lot of rituals and ceremonies take place. So he's sharing all of this. And then, oh, so here's a, a kind of a view of what he might have been seeing that first time he put on the, the live feed goggles. So I think uh, we're somewhere on here. The team is somewhere in this image um, and he was seeing so seeing himself from above for the first time but then that third perspective is subsurface so as we're excavating sites after having looked from that aerial vantage point having walked the site together taken notes we're sitting we're excavating 
And Remisi is sitting, looking at materials coming out of the ground, feeling feeling the sediments in his hands, um, smelling them, and telling us about other memories, uh, just narrating um, what he's what he's thinking as we're doing this. So it was a really intense experience. We spent um, several weeks working with Remisi at a variety of different sites, um, and we also experimented a little bit with, um, in this case, Ramzati Kelly, uh, Ramzati Bey, um, as she wove um, this mat, but also as she was preparing um, uh, freshwater fish and some other things, recording her memories of the evolution of the Namunti site, which is a, a village that she lives in currently, but that village changed locations multiple times, um, a couple times during her her life, but then also in her um, parents' and grandparents' lives, that community moved for different reasons, in some cases for political reasons. And so she was sort of narrating the history of the site as she's um, engaged in some of these in some of these activities around the around the community. Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit more about the kind of analysis we did with this bigger oral history archive to give you some sense of, um, back to Amy's opening question about what kind of relationship oral history can have with archeological research and you know scientific research. And this was also experimental for us because um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Tanambila Rasulundraini, who's currently the director of the sort of Center of Ethnology at the University of Tuliar, and I worked through this archive. And as we worked through it, we we wanted to experiment with integrating local community understandings of how this sort of human and environmental system works, particularly with regard to climate change and climate unpredictability and evolutionary theories about how people adapt. And we had been invited to contribute a paper to a special issue on human adaptation to climate and wanted to see whether this was a fruitful exercise to try to bring together, in other words, um, local theory, right? And sort of evolutionary theory to see, again, going back to Wilson Justin's um, provocation, parallel lines never meet, but maybe they can engage with one another if you stop at the same time on the tracks and, and turn and face one another. So what came out of our analysis of this pretty big archive, and I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of what's possible here, is this idea that social memory seemed to be a dominating mechanism, an overarching mechanism regulating how people interacted with resources how people interacted with one another in terms of establishing and maintaining social ties, and how people decided to move around the landscape. So we, we wanted to dig into this a little bit more. And when I say social memory, the way I'm defining it is the sort of consensus we have as a community or as a group, as a constituency of a community, the consensus we have about how we're remembering something that happened. Okay, so social memory, we could all probably as a group here have a discussion together and come up with sort of our social memory, our sort of consensus understanding of what the pandemic was, the COVID-19 pandemic was to us, how we remember it, how we remember particular events um, that occurred during the pandemic For as an example. So social memory is sort of this consensus building process um, so it's dynamic. It's not fixed in time. Social memory changes and it's something that is maintained and um, shaped by ongoing interactions between members of a particular community or group. Okay. All right. And I, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I do want, and I don't know, are there, have there been any questions in the chat, Amy? No? No, they have not. But I told people to feel free to to add them if they, if things come up. Please do feel free to interject um, because, you know, I could talk about this all day and all night 
And if there are particular things that interest you, we can spend more time on them. But so as we're going through this archive, particular themes kept rising to the surface. And so we tried to then organize those themes along three different lines. And basically we had a group of themes that were sort of pressures in the environment. So here you had hypervariable climate, variability and scarcity of resources, and then issues around how to manage common pool resources. The second group of themes um, was how people were sort of responding to those pressures. So there were these mechanisms that were seemed to be responses to pressures that people were experiencing. Some of those included social identities and ties, changing subsistence practices, so shifting subsistence strategies, and then mobility. And then the third group of themes was the outcome of utilizing those kinds of strategies, those mechanisms in response to those pressures. And those included an increase in social capital and cooperation on the landscape, less variance in resource access, meaning that fewer, there's more evenness in terms of everybody's ability to access resources, and then a slight reduction in the depletion of resources. Okay. So as we thought about those groupings of themes and this, again, this idea that we were gonna experiment with evolutionary theory and, and local theory and understandings of human environment dynamics, we came up with niche construction, which is sort of more of a framework than a, a, a really explicit theory. But niche construction is the concept that organisms, whether they're humans or other organisms, are not passive in their environment. That all organisms in some way act to change the factors in their environment, right? To change, modify their environment in such a way that they promote their own fitness and the fitness of their, their descendants. So here's a classic example of niche construction the spider's web. So the spider changes its environment by building a web. And that web allows the spider to more easily hunt, right? And more easily then ensure its own, its own sort of evolutionary fitness. So people are niche constructors par excellence. I'm sitting in an apartment. The temperature is controlled to my liking, right? I have access to a grocery store where I can find the different kinds of foods I want. I'm oversimplifying here, but but human beings construct a niche everywhere they go, and and we modify the environment in really really drastic ways. Okay, so we decided we'd take niche construction as a sort of framework or theory, and combine it with the the sort of evolutionary logic that was coming out of this oral history archive. And what we came up with was at the center, and I'm using the spider's web here also in as a design principle for the diagram, is that social memory is at the core of regulating this system. So social memory, people's shared and consensus built understanding of how people interacted with one another in the past, how people used resources in the past, how people moved around this landscape is what actually allows people and determines how people move today, how they establish and maintain their social connections today, how they um, utilize resources today in response to the different pressures in this environment. And as a result of that system being at work, what you see in the background, these um, blue and green and purple circles, the availability and the distribution of natural resources on that landscape changes, is impacted by this sort of human system that's that's operating um, that's operating uh, at the same time. And and what we are sort of hypothesizing is that um, this system over the long term has facilitated people's ability to weather changes in climate, climate unpredictability over 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 the long term. So in other words, the transmission of oral history, the transmission of you know other kinds of stories and other legacies on the landscape. So 
changes in vegetation patterns that are a result of how people managed the land in prior generations, all of that information that's getting passed down forms the basis of social memory that then regulates how people use resources, move and interact with one another, okay? <clears throat> so just as one example, and I'm gonna actually um, cut this part short so that I can talk a little bit about the um, experiments with scuba diving. But as one example, in terms of social identities and ties through this oral history project, we mapped out a huge number of different uh, types of social connections and different types of sort of social identities that people rely on flexibly in this region as conditions change. What had been known or discussed by anthropologists working in this region previously was that there were sort of two forms of social identity, right? One is your clan-based identity, which is fixed and unchanging, and that's what's called tariki up here in the dark green. And the other was this subsistence-based identity, the vezu fisher, the masikuru cattle herder, the mikea forager, and that those subsistence, subsistence identities emerged, as I said earlier, from that splintering of those agro-pastoral clans sometime around 400 years ago. And as a result, you know, just sort of by historical circumstance, some folks ended up being fishers on the coast, some ended up being foragers in the forest. And as a result, they kind of maintained that subsistence-based identity on top of their clan-based identity. But what we found through this oral history project is that actually people maintain a multitude of different identities. And, and that makes total sense. I mean, if you think about yourself and somebody externally came and tried to define you in this, let's say, two-dimensional way, you are just, you know, you are a, a Columbia affiliate and you come from New York City, just as one example. You know, if you were to think about that, you'd think, well, actually, I'm, I have a lot more uh, facets to my personal identity than that, right? And maybe at different times, those different components of my identity are more important than others, or I I leverage them more, or I, I rely on them more to form other connections with other people or other groups. And the same is true here. You know, people are basically relying differentially on different forms of identity as it is helpful, um, to navigate changing conditions. So depending on what's happening with the climate, if there's a, a relatively short drought, you might start to rely on these bartering or trading partnerships because maybe the drought is not impacting people who are in fishing communities quite as much as it's impacting people inland who are relying on um, cultivating those stream stream channels. And so maybe you rely on fortifying those kinds of relationships and partnerships. And, and that leads to, um, yeah, presenting yourself um, uh, more heavily in, in a certain, in a certain way. But at another point in time, maybe what becomes most important, let's say that drought goes on for a really long time and starts to impact all communities in the vicinity. Maybe what you need to start relying on is your clan-based affiliation that connects you also with um, your clan, your your lungu, your relatives much further away. And you need to be able to activate that that social connection. Um, so the result of, of looking at that was just to see that under different pressure conditions, different climatic scenarios, people were, were relying on these different um, social ties and identities in different ways. So now I'm going to I'm going to advance the slides. There's a lot of information in this and I know that you all read the um 2021 paper that um Dr. Russell Indrani and I co-authored. So you've seen some of this analysis there. Um I'll go through this. You can look at some of the photos and I want to talk a little bit more about a second sort of experimental dimension of this project. Um, and then open it up for discussion so that we can see what kinds of um, comments and um, ideas you all have. Okay. <clears throat> so let me just talk a little bit about this because this is really the basis or the driving motivation now from so somewhat of a theoretical perspective <clears throat> on how we need to continue to integrate 
the oral history work with archaeology and paleoclimate research. So the idea is that people are not now in the past or in the future responding directly to changes in climate. What people are responding to is their, their memory and their perception of what is changing in the climate and how people themselves and others responded in the past. So people are not, people are never really responding directly to um, uh, a, a change in their environment. They're responding, you're responding to a perception of that change. And that perception is very much based on social memory of past change and social memory of past response to change. I know that sounds a little bit convoluted, but but bear with me. So what we're trying to understand in this ongoing work is how using archaeological, oral historical um, methods, how can we trace in deeper time how well social memory is transmitted, especially across periods of big change in climate? So, you know, Southwest Madagascar is a region of the world that has long experienced hypervariability in climate. We know through paleoclimate reconstruction of, you know, periods when there was a mega drought that extended for decades, right? And so we can look at those particular times and try to understand how people responded, what was the impact of that in terms of people's mobility across the landscape, because we can look at the distribution of archeological sites. We can try to understand how social ties and connections um, as a postdoc who I work with, Dylan Davis, who is also one of my graduate students, um, has looked at how social networks, so people's social ties and connections, how those change as climate changed in the past. So we're trying to use archaeology to understand not just how people responded, but whether social memory of past change is something that is actually transmitted across many generations. That's something that we can get at a little bit more easily if we're we're focused more on the present and the the near past. But doing that in the deeper past is challenging and requires this integration of oral history and archaeology. So the way that we're doing this now is we're using the oral history archive to try to build up a database of what the material signatures might be of a particular response to changing climate. Because a, an archaeologist only has the material record really to go by. So we need to understand if somebody says, for example, that if a drought lasts for a year, people start to activate those bartering partnerships. They start to build up um, trade partnerships, maybe somebody on the coast with somebody inland, because you might be experiencing different conditions um, at that same time. <clears throat> but if that drought goes on for a really long period of time, maybe then people enact other um, strategies in some cases, rainmaking ceremonies that might leave some material signature that maybe we can find in deeper time. So we're using oral histories now, sort of in like an ethno-archeological process to build up a database of material signatures of responses to change. And then we're taking that and we're going back to the archeological record and the paleoclimate record. We're looking at periods like you see here, so the, the really big, you know, zigzag marks signal big changes in climate and environment. So we're looking at those periods in particular and seeing whether we can identify any of the same material signatures or similar material signatures that we might have recorded through that analysis of the oral history record. And then we're seeing how far in time, how long, um, and also spatially, how extensively those material signatures appear in the archaeological record. And our goal is to be able to demonstrate, actually, that the transmission of intergenerational knowledge is incredibly important as people deal with changes in climate and environment. And that if we're moving into a future um, in which climate is changing, we know that, um, and we are not supporting communities in transmitting that intergenerational knowledge, right? We're not supporting the 
preservation of storytelling traditions, or we're not supporting that kind of cultural um, knowledge and preservation, what is lost and what's the danger then in terms of people having access to a bigger basket of potential strategies that are locally adapted over many generations that might help you know, communities weather future storms, so to speak. So we're really trying to integrate oral history, archaeology, paleoclimate science to look at the importance for the future of maintaining social memory and maintaining access to intergenerational knowledge. Okay, <clears throat> so that work and um, uh, the sort of work around now understanding changes in the local environment today is really grounded in this, I'm going to call it a team, um, but it's it's a project called the Vesu Ecological Knowledge Exchange that we started in 2019. Here we are at Penn State and at the Smithsonian with a delegation uh, from Southwest Madagascar, including uh, traditional medicinal plant healers and users, um, traditional fishers, uh, local leaders, local youth who came to have a series of workshops around environmental questions and in different labs at Penn State and at the Smithsonian that work on environmental and climate related questions, exchanging knowledge and workshopping um, themes for future research. So just to say very quickly, one of the themes that we talked about is the disappearance of keystone species on the landscape, and one in particular, which is Gavodia madagascariensis, known as uh, farafatsi, which is a tree that's incredibly important to Vezu fishers because they use it to build their fishing canoes and a lot of the, the tools that they use for fishing on the coast. So farafatsi is incredibly important, and elders have noted that the tree's distribution and the demography of the tree has shifted substantially in the last decade. And so the question is why, what's driving that? Um, and so we're working with the, the VIC delegation to kind of map out a research project around Farafatsi. Here we are this past summer in Madagascar with the more expanded uh, VIC team uh, made up of elders from across Philandriac. And we're workshopping um, here a project on the corals, which is part of paleoclimate reconstruction that we're doing. Um, <clears throat> and what's coming out of these meetings is both a recording of elders' knowledge about, you know, in some cases, keystone species like farafatsi um, or a particular species of coral. And how the research then can have some kind of impact on what's happening today. So as we were talking about the corals, we're coring these long-lived uh, parietes colonies that when I say long-lived, they can live for 500, maybe even 600 years. <laughs> and we can core them to reconstruct a very high resolution record of changes in climate over that period on a biannual basis, which is incredibly high resolution. So we can record changes in sea surface temperatures, nutrient dynamics, um, precipitation, et cetera, over that time period if, if the samples are ideal and we're able to get those kinds of cores. But so what the VIEC delegation here is in this image is discussing is what impact um, can it have to be drawing both research attention to some of these long-lived colonies that, that by the way, people know almost like they're they're human beings, right? These are these coral colonies that that are, you know, really old are also really big. Um, so one of them, for example, um, is well known in the community because boats always um, bump up against it, and if if a a boat captain doesn't know what they're doing as well. Um, people <laughs> people joke about how they're always going to get caught by that particular coral head, and so they really are per personable. They're like they're like individuals in the community. But so here, um, Monsieur Roger is talking about the potential impact in terms of conservation measures of linking conservation discussions with the um, the research, the paleoclimate research, because what we can say 
is that some of the long lived corals are ones that have weathered a lot of changes in climate and environment, right? And somehow they have, they've managed to survive. So is there a way in which we can link these, um, these discussions so that some of the conservation work is focused on preserving these long lived corals um, and learning from sort of the paleoclimate work, um, what kinds of conditions these corals have been able to survive. So that's part of the discussion here. Um, <clears throat> and this is an image of the same group, the Vezu uh, Ecological Knowledge Exchange Delegation performing a ceremony to thank, thank the ancestors, but also to thank not just human ancestors, but we evoked the corals in, in this ceremony. And we also evoked the baobabs. And there's, we have a another project looking at baobab um, changes in the demography of the baobab population. So I just wanted to insert that. But with regard to um, uh, to the corals, what we're also doing now in terms of um, oral history and kind of traditional ecological knowledge recording is having the elders who are part of the, the VEEK delegation learn to scuba dive um, so that they can accompany the team, the research team underwater, um, and, and not just as part of the research, but also as part of a, a new, for them, experience of connecting with that, <coughs> excuse me, with that underwater space um, in a way that's really peaceful and allows people to take the time um, to observe what's happening underwater. And if you think about it, um, you know, communities who have fished for many, many generations have a, a very in-depth understanding of the underwater world. Um, and at the same time, that the, the perspectives that they have come from physical interactions with the underwater space that are different from what you might experience if you're scuba diving and you have this air supply and buoyancy and all of these safety measures in place to be able to be underwater for extended periods of time. More and more, and this is why I put this image here, Vezu community's experience of the underwater world has become precarious. The amount of pressure that people are under to harvest high value species like sea cucumber, lobster, um, octopus means that while at the same time, industrial fishing operations are harvesting at a really intensive rate, means that people are pushing themselves, fishers are pushing themselves physiologically to the limits. Um, and not just fishers who are who are fishing underwater um, using nets or um, using fishing lines, but um, women also who are gleaning, particularly women and children who are gleaning in the near shore environment are putting themselves more and more at risk because um, they're having to go longer, deeper, um, in spaces that they might not normally have sought to harvest from before because resources are declining and because the pressures are increasing. <laughs> Excuse me. So there is also an aspect of healing in this process of um, trying to bring the, the VEEK delegation underwater as scuba divers to experience this underwater environment um, and eventually to be able to open it up more to more community members as part of an extended effort to record community knowledge of the underwater world but also to create a space for reconnection and healing in the underwater space through um, through scuba. So we, what we've done is we've launched a community dive center. Um, here's somebody who's hunting octopus, looking for the octopus under, under these rocks. <clears throat> and, and this can be incredibly dangerous, not only because octopuses are very smart and can be really strong and can... Um, pull you under, but also because this environment is full of things like stonefish um, and lionfish and other um, poisonous critters. But so we've launched this community dive center again as this space where we can combine research with, um, you know, recording local knowledge, but also engage in a process of kind of reconnecting um, communities and environments in a way that you know, uh, certainly doesn't er erase um, some of the violence that's being done to communities um, who are living in especially 
places like this where there are a lot of interests in extracting resources at the industrial scale, um, but can can be a process of um, of healing in some in some way. So this dive center was launched this summer, and as I said, we're working on um, get making it possible for the elders who are part of the project to get scuba certified and to be able to come um, and dive and um, also commune with some of the the ancestors or elders that are these large long-lived coral colonies. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Here's an image of us just coring a Parides colony this summer. And here on the right is um, Odilon, one of the members of the MAP team, carrying like a torch, carrying a, a segment of a coral core back to the boat. So I'm going to stop there for now um, and open it up to discussion. All of this work to me is incredibly important because, you know, at the end of the day, as an archaeologist, even though I work in deeper time with, you know, communities that are no longer living, uh, archaeology makes no sense to me unless it has some kind of impact on people who are alive today. And communities in this part of the world are um, facing a huge number of challenges to their livelihoods and to preserving, you know, a way of life that is just incredibly threatened. And so if in any way we can bring together oral history work, archaeology, paleoclimate science, to have some kind of impact on um, people's ability to weather future storms and to maintain um, access to the diversity of strategies that people have tried and tested in the past, um, then, you know, then I'm on board and um, I'm excited to to keep the work moving forward. So I'll end there and I hope you have tons of questions. I want to talk. I want to hear all of the things that you're thinking. Thank you so much. Um, Christina, that was amazing. I know I have a ton of questions um, and I can open it up. People can ask questions in the chat. Um, you also can um, unmute yourselves or raise your hands. I think we're, we'll see if we're, if we're deluged. Um, I can, I can start with one off because um, I have one in mind that I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on. Um, you said it's important to support this kind of intergenerational knowledge transfer. Um, and so I'm curious both what's disrupting that? Like what makes it need to be supported? Um, and then what are you noticing about the the ways that that's happening um, sort of uh, outside of these formal oral history interviews that you're doing? Or I guess not formal, but recorded. Well, I'll give kind of a, a generic example. I think there are a lot, but just to get the conversation going, a generic example would be still the approach to a lot of conservation work being um, exclusion of people from place. So through the creation of protected areas, whether it's like a marine protected area or a closure in the marine uh, protected area for um, for the fishery to recover. All of that is based on this idea that, you know, in order for ecosystems to, to be healthy, people need to be kept out of them. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that then that it lumps together all people, first of all, and doesn't distinguish between people who have been stewards of land and seas for many generations. And it also then creates this negative, I think, perception that everywhere where people are allowed to be present, and, and especially in this case, people who come from rural communities, that you're going to have a tragedy of the commons outcome where all resources are going to get, you know, consumed without discrimination and you know that kind of exclusion practice completely ignores the knowledge and the histories that people have and can share about why particular parts of the landscape for example are um are in the condition that they're in and so there's this example from a different part of madagascar where um in the middle of this sort of secondary forest, there was this patch of what seemed to be primary growth um, that was in really good condition. And a conservation group sort of swooped in and said, wow, 
you know, this is amazing. Let's make sure that this remains protected. Mm. And without really engaging with the community, they got permission to create this protected area. Um, and in presenting that documentation that came from, you know, the central government and, and higher up to the local community, the local community, you know, you know, didn't really say anything, but in a way, um, threw their hands up and what ended up happening is that patch of forest started to get um, exploited mm -hmm. by the local community and it turns out you know through discussion after the fact it turns out that the community felt like their ancestors had been evicted from mm -hmm. that patch of forest and that they had been protecting that patch of forest because their ancestors lived there mm. <laughs> and that once they had been evicted you know, there's no reason to protect that anymore. Um, so that's just one example, I think, of how um, without taking into consideration local history and knowledge, um, there can be real violence done in terms of top down in particular or outside in um, management initiatives and, you know, conservation initiatives. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's a, a lot of other examples, too. And um yeah, it's a it's a it's an important question, but I I think that the things that are impacting some of that transmission are quite frankly just drastic changes in the landscape that come from industrial extraction, so big mining operations that you know change the face of of the land very rapidly and wipe away a lot of those ecological legacies that I was alluding to. So you know vegetation that is the result of many generations of land use and stewardship. Um, and likewise, you know, in the marine scape, um, you know, the kind of fishing that just with drag nets that just rips everything up off the sea floor, um, that completely changes the, the seascape in a way that then leads people not to be able to um, share what that seascape was like because it's gone you know it disappears so quickly and then you know it's hard to reconstruct so another project that we'd like to develop in the future is using oral history and some of this ecological knowledge recording to help generate both vr experiences of what that environments or many environments looked like in the past hmm. um, but then also to use that to then project forward um, what environments are likely to look like given the persistence and preservation of traditional practices mm. um, under different climate scenarios mm. and what they're likely to look like in the absence of those traditional practices under different climate scenarios so that people can, both people in the community and from other communities can get a real sense in virtual reality of what landscapes are going to look like with or without the transmission of intergenerational knowledge and practice. That's amazing. There's a one question in the chat and then I wanna hear from Chrissy. Mary Ann asked um, if you collaborate with anthropologists. And I was wondering the same thing actually in terms of, you know, I, I'm my training is in cultural anthropology and, um, especially in terms of how stories get passed on sort of in everyday life um, right now, or if it's in special settings, like that seems like a little cultural anthropologist thing. So it's the question, do I collaborate with anthropologists? Mm -hmm. I mean, you are an anthropologist in a way, right? But like, uh, do you collaborate with anthropologists maybe that focus more on the present or? Yeah, I do. I mean, yes. Yes. And I love this question because I feel I feel in some way that this is a good thing that I'm not really recognizable by any field. <laughs> um, I am an anthropologist, you know, my degree is in anthropology. Um, you know, I'm an archaeologist, but really um, trained in anthropological approaches to archaeology. Huh. Um, and yes, I work with a few anthropologists, including Bram Tucker, who's a behavioral ecologist at the University of Georgia. Um, and others, but you know, my, my take on this, and maybe this is evading the question or evading the substance of the question is really that, um, I want my work to be guided by the questions that I think matter the most, and then to figure out what methods, what sort of theoretical frameworks are going to help us 
address those questions. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that question is more heavily an earth sciences question or more heavily a sort of anthropology question, um, I don't take that much time to think about, but but I am really interested in developing, <laughs> excuse me. And I think actually that the questions that are the most interesting are the ones that are not recognizable really as belonging to any one particular field. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't know if I'm evading the question, uh, but yeah, I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist in, in trying to be an anthropologist in disguise. <laughs> I think that's a good answer. Um, Chrissy, do you want to ask your question? Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I'm really interested in um, things you were saying about kind of uh, touching on perspective and how um, ways of seeing can impact um, different expressions for ways of knowing land. Um, so thinking about the aerial view versus the direct kind of observation and the subsurface. And then um, also in your in the scuba practice of, of introducing um, the ability to do scuba diving as a, a new way to, to see and experience a landscape. So I'm, I'm interested in if you see a link in those, um, in those two ways of working and, and also just the, um, you know, whether having sort of a mediation of technology in those observations of land from different perspectives, if you feel that that impacted the kinds of stories that were shared. Um, and, and also, sorry to have kind of a three tier question. But, um, you know, if so, um, if you saw any generational differences in how, um, how those those kind of new tools for for perspective, um, may have impacted kind of the the kinds of stories that were that were told. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I like I love those questions. Can we clarify just the first one? I want to make sure that I understand the first part of the question where you said, um, do those two different ways or approaches, how do those interact with one another? Um, and what were the two ways? Um, yeah, I guess I'm thinking of the the two examples that you presented okay. of of the um, kind of the drone and the subsurface, um, yeah. and then and then the scuba practice. Like if you see that as um, extensions of the same idea of sort of seeing um, something known in new ways, um, or if it just sort of happens to happens to fall that way. Yeah, I love that question. You know, and just to be perfectly honest, the reason those two examples, I think the reason those two approaches, those two different experiments came to the fore is because I feel very uncomfortable and uh, upset by the fact that people who come from the outside into that territory, that landscape, you know, and that seascape, um, <clears throat> who come either on vacation or who come as researchers with a lot of tools and technology and money have these privileged vantage points um, that are often extremely invasive vantage points um, on the landscape and the seascape. And so invasive, for example, because there are a lot of parts of the landscape that are off limits to people who are not even, you know, who are not um, from who are not from Madagascar, but not from that particular part of Madagascar <clears throat> or, you know, off limits to anybody but a particular clan or a particular group of people. So a lot of that sacred landscape is constantly getting invaded <clears throat> by people who are, you know, using different technologies to image things, um, you know, including drones and um, different high powered cameras and things like that. Um, and the seascape too is constantly getting invaded and people have this opportunity to have these privileged experiences. I mean, there are now some luxury hotels in the Southwest that fly guests in um, and sort of bypass every, every, every level of community sovereignty over that space. So where, let's say you're a tourist and you drive into Andavadok and you want to be there on vacation. And people are very welcoming. You know, they they welcome tourists to come visit. That's not that's not the point that I'm making. But you drive into Andavadok, and you might then have, if you are meaning to be respectful, 
and uh, aware of local practices, you would greet the community leader, in this case, president of the Fukuntani, and introduce yourself. At, at minimum, that would be a way to respectfully enter the community, right? Very few people do that, even when driving in. But to make the point, now these luxury hotels are flying people in, bypassing even just that process of driving down the main street of the community and having people see who you are. You know, people have a right to see who's coming into their community. So they're bypassing even that. They get to this little offshore island or they get to this little peninsula now that they've totally fenced off and walled off. And then they they go on a catamaran and they don fancy scuba gear and they get to go to the fanciest sort of um, <clears throat> locations that are oftentimes, you know, the most sort of sacred um, and important parts of the seascape. And they get to do that to enjoy sort of recreational diving, whatever. So that that process to me is really violent. And I felt, you know, that I had an opportunity to use tools that I was able to buy with research funds um, to, you know, share that vantage point with others, both out of my own curiosity, you know, what do you think about, what do you think about this? What do you think about seeing the landscape from this perspective? Um, but then also through the sort of collaborative process, discussing whether this is a way that maybe, you know, we can talk more about knowledge and histories that, you know, people hold about, about these places. So yeah, the, those two examples came really, I think from that, that place of just wanting to disrupt something that I find extremely problematic. And I think, especially with the seascape as a scuba diver, you know, as somebody who loves just, I, I just love being underwater and I love that um, incredibly peaceful sensation to think about how dangerous the underwater world is for a lot of people who are under huge pressures to maintain their livelihoods under conditions that are just working against them because, you know, of all the industrial level extraction, climate change, there's so many threats to livelihoods. Uh, and then to think historically too about the experiences of black peoples, African and African descendant peoples, as they, you know, have both experienced waterways as places of um, flight and subsistence and um, joy in some ways, um, but especially have experienced a lot of violence um, in waterways. So there are a lot of reasons why that particular one means a lot to me and I think is going to be really powerful. I also just think talking with the the VIC delegation and seeing how excited they are about putting on, you know, scuba tanks and getting underwater. You know, people are so curious because they've seen, you know, especially, you know, white travelers and researchers, et cetera, come in and put on all this fancy gear and then be able to be underwater for an hour. Um, they're very curious about what that experience is like. So, you know, they're excited to to see that and experience that. Um, and now I've like lost a thread of your other two really important questions, but um, can you remind me? Um, yeah, I was just curious how um, having these viewpoints that are mediated by technology might've impacted the stories and generationally. You know, I mean, I mean, that's, that's something that I think will, will continue to, to discover as we we go through this experience. I can say that with the VR goggles, a lot of elders were just like, whoa, <laughs> this is <laughs> like one person I thought was so interesting. And I, I feel like we should we should spend more time thinking about it too, but was just talking about all the colors they were seeing. And at the time I thought they're just very disoriented by what they're seeing right now. But what they were sharing was just essentially like this description of this sensorial experience of swirling colors <laughs> everywhere. So certainly the technology, people's individual experience with the technology or level of comfort or discomfort with the technology makes a huge difference in terms of what um, what stories they share, what, what they share. Um, but it's gonna be really interesting, I think with the diving um, and to see, yeah, to see across different individuals, but also, you know, men and women, how they, how they ex describe that experience and what kinds of memories it, it elicits for them. Yeah. But thank you. Those are really great questions, Chrissy. Yeah. Thank you. 
Lori, I'm curious what's what's on your mind. So many things. I had new questions pop up while you're talking, but I'm not going to ask all of them. Um, just to be mindful of time and space. Thank you, Christina. Um, okay, so one of the new questions I'm not asking all of them. One of the new questions that came up is if you be you will talk about a bit about how you built relationships with the different um, Malagasy communities um, in your work and as an integral part of being able to um, undertake this work. Um, and then my other question is about the baobab trees. Um, yeah, I wrote it down, so let me make sure I get it correct. Yep, how they seem to appear around archaeological sites. Um, I'm curious about what the nature of that interspecies relationship is, which you've gleaned of that. And I'm curious if looking backwards, that's something that you've been able to trace as true for whatever archaeology was called in cultural practice before we, you know, named it and practiced it this way. Yeah. Thank you, Lori. I love those questions. Um, let me, I'm going to start with the Baobab question because it's freshest on my mind. For Madagascar, I don't know the answer to your question, but um, the hypothesis and the suggestion comes from archaeological work in West Africa in particular, where through a lot of extensive landscape survey, that pattern of baobabs clustering around um, settlements and villages has been consistent um, through time. And it may be that the soil conditions that human settlements create, the types of organic you know, waste that people generate is something that baobabs really like. It's also, you know, possible that people are just really, um, because baobabs are really useful in terms of the fruit and the bark and all these things that that people um, preserve the baobabs that are, you know, near their settlements. It's it's hard to say exactly which way that relationship is going in terms of, you know, what's what's driving what. Um, but it is clear that there's a a link there. And and baobabs are just, <coughs> excuse me, one of um, many species that, you know, tend to co-occur with, with human settlements. In Madagascar, um, there's a student at Penn State in geosciences named Karen Pham, who's part of our team. And um, Karen is working on the baobab project. And I'm sure we'll have more insights about um, specifically in the Madagascar case, what is this link between baobabs and human settlements? But certainly, as in West Africa, the baobabs in Madagascar are heavily used by people. Um, they're used, again, for their fruit, um, for their bark, the seeds and the oils that come from the seeds, um, their um, sort of semi-sacred. Um, the name for them is Mother of the Forest. So there are a lot of stories that center around the baobab trees and <laughs> what we're seeing in Southwest Madagascar is a change in baobab demographics where it seems like you've got a lot of really young baobabs, like the the kids basically, and, and maybe some of the early teens, the, tw the tween baobabs. But then there's this whole segment of the population that seems to be missing. Um, and then all you have left are the older, the elder baobabs. And so we're trying to figure out what's happened to that middle part of the population, why there's that decline, because that it doesn't bode well for the long-term kind of survival of those populations. Um, and then your first question um, was, remind me. Your relationship with the communities, what that looks Thank like. That you. Seems like it. you know, all I can say is time and <clears throat> time and considering that uh, as with any relationship, you know, there's input into that relationship that makes it a relationship. And I think, you know, you think about a lot of research is, uh, is extractive. You know, you come in, you want to collect data or you want to do whatever. And you, you know, maybe you kind of cursorily or in a superficial way, you give something back, but you, you in my view, if you want to build this kind of real collaboration, you have to be willing to at least acknowledge and understand what it means to be a part of that community. So what do other members of that community give as members of a community? You know, what happens if somebody dies? What happens if somebody is gets married or is, you know, there are all of these aspects of life that require community members to show up, to step up in various ways. And 
you know, I think over the years of working in the Southwest and specifically in Villandriac, um, and learning what it takes to be a member of that community, um, and then striving to give, um, in that way so that I can show up for people there as a member of the community, even if I don't live there year round, um, you know, that means different things in different communities, you know, but I think understanding what it means to be a member of the community and to show up is key. And if you, if you then really want to develop those kinds of lasting partnerships, I think you have to be willing to invest in, in showing up in that way, if that makes sense, but it takes time, you know, it takes time and it takes transparency, you know, so I think, you know, you can come in as a, a, a new member of a community, right. And, and your relationship is in a certain stage. Um, and then over time, you know, it matures and it becomes something, something else. But I love that question. And I think for me, it's all about, you know, learning how to be a part of a community. Thank you. Um, we're just about at time. There's two questions that are hanging out there. Maybe we could, if you have another minute, we could ask both of them and you could respond in whatever way you, you have time for. Um, Kathy Nastrum says in the chat, uh, as an oral historian trained in history, I appreciate how deeply historical your research questions and insights are. Thank you. My question, a small group of oral historians is working at the juncture of environmental history and oral history. Is your work informed by environmental history in any way? And then Clarissa, do you want to ask, ask your question too? Um, and uh, Christina can kind of consider them together. Uh, yeah, so I'm working on um, like the intersections between plants and plant medicine and oral history. So I'd be interested to hear more about um, your work with like foragers and plant medicine people. Thank you, Clarissa. And I see also Olivia had a hand up. Oh, sorry. For some reason, it's not showing up for me. Olivia, did you have a question? Um, I'm afraid I didn't. If I'm the Olivia in question, I don't know if there's another. Okay. Okay, there. I thought I thought I saw a hand up. Maybe it was just on my screen. Okay, so both of these are are amazing questions. I'm gonna say to Catherine's question, absolutely. And um, there's a lot of important um sort of historical events that have really shaped uh the landscape in Southwest Madagascar. And the I think classic example is the prickly pear cactus and the efforts by the French colonial administration to eradicate the prickly pear in the earlier part of the 20th century. And that has had lasting repercussions in the Southwest, South and Southwest in terms of people's ability to deal with drought and to successfully get their herds through periods of extended drought. Um, so there's a lot of research out there about the the prickly pear. I've written a little bit about it, but um, it's not my original research. There, um, there are some other papers out there. But if you look at, if you're interested in that particular story, and you Google, um, you know, prickly pear South Madagascar, you'll come up with a whole list of um, papers and things that you can look at. But that's that's really important to me because I, I'm interested in looking at how historical events. Um, can and should be taken into and acknowledged in thinking about climate reparations and the vulnerabilities that communities face today in dealing with the climate crisis that are linked to these historical events. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a quick answer to a really important question. And then to Clarissa's question, I am working with um, an ethnobotanist also at Penn State, um, whose name is Eric Burkhart, and we're developing together um, with the community this project about the um, farafatsi tree. But one of the goals of that project is to use farafatsi. Oh, wow, someone's mm. calling me. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Um, to use the farafatsi um, as a sort of as a keystone species that is linked to a bunch of other plants that people also use, but as a way to um, start to document some of that other plant use in greater detail. Um, so again, quick, kind of a quick answer to your question, but one of the members of the VEEK delegation is a medicinal plant user and a midwife. And, um, you know, we're documenting some of the plants that she uses in particular um, from the Southwest. There are a lot of 
a lot of medicinal plants. And this is also, I think, really important in thinking about the exposure people have to um, industrial levels of extraction, because that, you know, there's a lot of knowledge that it can be commercialized in terms of pharmaceutical applications and others um, like periwinkle in Madagascar and uh, other other plants. So another very important question. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. I know you have a very full personal and professional life and I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to share this work with us. Um, I think it's something we're probably gonna be talking about for a long time and I hope we can stay in conversation um, and, and best of luck for continuing this research. I hope you'll keep us updated too. Thank you so much. It's been so nice. I'm sorry I went on. I went on a little longer than I wanted to, um, but let's stay in touch so that we can keep the conversation going. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much, so much more, and I, I appreciate everything you had to share. So it didn't feel like too much at all. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everyone. It's so good to see you all. All right. Good night. And folks Have who are in night. my class, stick around for a minute. We'll do a little debrief. <laughs>